My finances went from being very, very simple to suddenly being kind of overwhelming. And so that usually pulls the cork for someone who's like, all right, I need an expert to tell me exactly what to do so that I can put this on autopilot and focus on the things that fulfill me. Today, I'm talking with Nate Hoskin of Hoskin Capital. Nate is an entrepreneur. He started his business in 2020 doing financial planning, taxes, and investments for Gen Z and millennials in a new way. I think you're going to love Nate's pragmatic and thoughtful approach to life and to building a business. We also talk a touch at the end about financial uh, planning on a personal level, if you're interested in doing something a bit different with how you plan. And then in our first segment, as always, I speak with Marty Beckerman about the stories he's covering for business.com, including an anthropomorphic Pop-Tart and compostable diapers. Yes, it's true. It's not the same old business content. Thanks. I'm with Marty Beckerman, as I am each week, to discuss three stories in the B newsletter. Sign up for free at business.com. Hi, Marty. How are you? Hey, John. How's it going? It's going good. One of the articles your team has written about is about electric vehicles. I have one. I got one about 18 months ago. I love it. Um, I can't imagine I can't imagine not having an electric car. Um, I feel like where I live in Seattle, uh, you, you can't throw a rock without hitting two or three electric cars. Um, but sales haven't been what a lot were expecting. Isn't that true? Right. I still have a Prius personally, so I haven't caught up. But um, the car industry expected EVs to grow by 100% this year. Uh, they only grew by 50%, which in any other product category, 50% year over year growth would be great. But this fell so short of expectations that now car manufacturers are really shrinking production on EVs. Um, Ford is curtailing its uh, electric truck. Um, Hertz, the car rental company, is selling off its Tesla fleet. Um, people don't even want to rent them, apparently. Uh, Elon Musk seems a little distracted uh, lately from running Tesla with his other uh, endeavors. And um, it's, uh, it's strange timing because California, which uh, has power over so much of the domestic car uh, market, um, has mandated that all new vehicles be electric only by 2035. So uh, you would think that the manufacturers would, would be ramping up for this, but things are actually seem to be pulling back right now. That's really interesting. I know you get into it more in depth in the newsletter. As a as a personal anecdote, if you're thinking about renting from Hertz, I've done it a couple times. I've rented electric cars recently. Actually, the experience. It for me has been great. They've been fairly equivalent prices. And um, and if you return the electric vehicle basically empty, it's like 25 bucks or or 35 bucks, way cheaper than it would be if you returned it empty, empty for gas. You don't even really have to recharge it. Um, okay, we'll 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 keep tabs on that one. Uh Marty, you you have a young child. Um and maybe on your registry, did you put one of those, like, um, did you do a diaper genie or did you do some type of diaper collection apparatus? We have the diaper genie, sure. One of the things that I was reading is that when a baby is out of diapers, he or she has gone through, you know, thousands of right. them. And there's so a, it's, <laughs> there's uh, a company looking to the, make it greener. The average baby goes through 4,000 diapers by the time they are a uh, toilet trained it adds up to millions of pounds not per baby but uh, in all through all the babies in society are creating millions of pounds weekly um one company called diaper with a y uh is trying to make diapers greener um by basically resuscitating the world war ii era diaper service uh for twenty dollars they will come in a truck pick up your dirty diapers recycle them and give you uh, new clean diapers. So it's kind of looking to the past uh, for a way to uh, make things more sustainable in the present. So we said in the newsletter, you know, electric vehicles maybe aren't going to save the world, but maybe uh, maybe, maybe the diaper <laughs> pickup people will, those poor delivery people. 
Yeah, uh, well, it sounds like it's it's totally compostable. Um, you ship them, which is which is interesting to me, and uh, and I I like it. Hopefully, they're successful in reducing that kind of waste. Um, well, if the first two stories had a bit of an environmental bent to them, this last one's more in the category of ritual sacrifice, which is not something you always cover in the B newsletter, but you do cover experiential marketing. Talk about this interesting story. Yeah, this was in our mind blown marketing segment um, last month uh, at the uh, <laughs> at the football game between Kansas State and North Carolina State uh, at uh, the Pop Tart Stadium. Pop Tarts had their mascot uh, come on the field. Uh, the mascot's name was Frosted Strawberry, a person in a Pop Tart suit, an anthropomorphic Pop Tart. Um, got into a toaster, a gigantic toaster waving and smiling, and then uh, a crispy Pop-Tart comes out the bottom and the players started eating the mascot that had just been dancing moments before. <laughs> uh, we were saying, you know, Tony the Tiger, Lucky the Leprechaun, Toucan Sam, Count Chocula, so many beloved uh, cereal mascots, but uh, uh, this is the first time a company has, has had the courage to execute theirs publicly. So, Wow, that's so funny. Were you a Pop-Tarts kid? Yeah, I hate so much. I haven't had a Pop Tart in years, but <laughs> Pop Tart's director of marketing said, uh, we sacrifice everything for flavor and why should we end at our mascot? Uh, also <laughs> saying that, uh, telling NPR that this kind of bold conversation starting moment they felt was on par with the Super Bowl commercial for how much viral, uh, viral hype they got. So, uh, you know, I think the tricks rabbit might wind up in a delectable uh, tomato ragu next. I don't know. Ooh, all right. Another another blast from the past. Thanks, Marty. Good to see you. Thanks, John. Hi, Nate. How are you? Good to see you. I'm doing well, John. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. I'm really excited to talk, about, talk with you today. Um, we all need financial planning. Uh, and I can think about how my dad has done it. He uh, he has someone who he went he went to college with who manages his finances. He talks to on the phone, email occasionally, and I, I I think that that's probably his generation's way of doing financial planning. Um, you've surveyed the market. You're a financial planner. What unmet needs do you think are in the market for younger generations like Gen Z or millennials? Yeah, I think. At a high level, the unmet need for younger generations is just the availability of financial planning and wealth management. Because I think that mm. so much of the industry, whether you are calling your broker on the phone to place trades like so many previous generations have done, or you're managing it on your own and you're using your own brokerage accounts and doing your research because personal finance is something that interests you, most of the services are geared either towards the complete DIY or for the already wealthy. And those are really the only two lines that you can walk. I think the unmet market and the unmet need are the people who would really like help from an expert, but don't necessarily have $250,000, $500,000 yet, and can in most cases do most of it themselves. They just need that one push, that one financial plan, or that one meeting to really clarify things for them. That makes a lot of sense. That's really clear how you articulated it. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if I if I just have a little bit of money and I'm doing some DIY stuff, I, I probably just should be like day trading. And um and then if I have if I have a ton of money, then it's probably worth it where I can get somebody on the bat phone to talk to me anytime I, I want. You actually uh coined a phrase. I don't know if you coined it, but anyway, I, I was the first time I had seen it on your site, which is uh the acronym Henry. What what is this? And what led you to believe you could start a new business serving this market? Yeah, I can't claim Henry. That's definitely been around. Okay. There are a couple. Okay. Um, yeah, there are Henrys. There are Dinks. And so Henrys are. I know. High I know earners. what Dinks are. Okay. Yeah. Double same idea. Come no kids, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you've got your Dinks, and then you also have your Henrys, which are high earners, not rich yet. And so those are people who are making really good money. We're often talking about engineers, salespeople, that sort of thing, who are making more than $120,000, $150,000. Uh, 
but they're very early in their career or they are currently paying off student loans from their education, things that are really inhibiting their ability to make money work for them, even though they're making it. I see. And so, um, and so what are some of the attributes of this, of this, uh, of this crowd? Like what, what are the, the top things that they, that they want or they crave at this point in their life or journey? I think the first two defining features of Henry's are drive and specialization because they're very, very driven, very, very successful. They are people who are very, very committed to the work that they do and are very excited about the work that they do, but they are often extremely specialized because to become so skilled in one thing that you can command such a high salary, it sometimes happens at the occlusion of everything else because you are just a software engineer. You are just a salesperson, whatever it happens to be. And so the other component, I think, is the time constraint and the distractibility, where they're very, very constrained on time because they are extremely busy. They just have so much going on. And they also don't necessarily want to be distracted because what they're doing is working so, so well. And so the thing that I've found that they want or the thing that I can help them with is I can be the expert in the room to just remove the learning curve, teach them what they need to know in a very concise fashion so that they can implement it and then forget about it as much as possible and go back to doing what has been so successful for them. And probably specialization, if you are specialized, you recognize the importance of specialization. So yes. you, you might be a great software engineer and you don't know much about finances or trading or investments or making the money work for you. You want somebody who's as specialized as you are. But maybe to get back to the problem statement that you were, you were talking to at, at the get go, um, you know, there, there may be a bunch of options if you've got five or 10 million bucks, but maybe not so many that are obvious. If you're, if you're not yet rich, you can't put that much money to work. So you had this insight, you recognized it. And during COVID, what happened? Maybe tell the origin story of your business. COVID was an adventure for all of us. <laughs> of and I think it facilitated a lot of change for a lot of people. A lot of people were side hustlers. They started something new. They had a realization that something in their life was important that they maybe weren't giving credence to. And I absolutely had that happen. And I was very much shoved into it because I was working for an RIA, a registered investment advisor. That's very often what you see as the companies that are serving multimillionaires and billionaires. And I was working as an intro financial advisor. I had come over from a hedge fund because I was super into data science. That's my major is finance and quantitative analytics. And so that was really where I was leaning, but decided, and there's, there's more to this that we can dig into if we'd like, but decided that I wanted to work directly with people. And so I chose to be a financial advisor and I was very much just getting my start. I had just learned the ropes. I was starting to build my own book. I was starting to interact with clients and actually take on the entire aspect of their financial life from investment management to the planning, to the relationship management. And then COVID struck and the person that I was working for decided that he was ready to retire. That was the last market crash and the last recession that he could really bear. And so I was laid off in March, uh, no, it was April of 2020. And I graduated college in May of 2020. And so after being fully employed for years and having such a good career lined up for me, I really felt like I was ahead of the game. I graduated without a job and the inability to go outside. Wow. And, so, and, and, and all that happened, you're probably, how did graduation happen? It was all virtual. Everybody was uh, shut down. So you couldn't even really go out for coffee with anybody and talk about this. Yeah, I, I heard that our graduation happened virtually. I was not there. I oh, was not, geez. I was not going to make that happen. Luckily they did do it the next year. So I was able to go oh, back good. down and do the ceremony, which felt good. But yeah, there was, there was not much in terms of fanfare when it came to me graduating college. Okay. So you're, you're getting your degree. You, um, you're, you're looking for a job or thinking about what's happening next. What gave you the confidence to start your own thing? Confidence might be a strong word. I think that it was more a 
a really nice exit strategy because the only people hiring were people who needed insurance salespeople. And I was not necessarily in a place where I wanted to sell life insurance. I didn't want to go down that sort of route. And so much of what I was being pitched by all of these companies was that I would get to own my own business, quote unquote. I would get to have my own book. All of the revenue would be mine, except for the 40, 50% that they would take for all the administrative things. And so I started to wonder if, if I'm going to be building my own business anyways, and I'm going to be given so much ownership, why not just actually do it myself? And so I was studying for my certified financial planner exam at the time. And while I was doing that, I was like, I might as well just try it because I have at least another year where I'm not really going to be going outside. I'm not necessarily in a place where the jobs that I would like to have are hiring. If this doesn't work, I can always talk to my clients and bring them in to the next place that I end up and still be able to serve them. And so it very much felt like a plan B at the beginning where I just might as well because I have nothing to do and I'm stuck inside and see if it works. That's amazing. And so take me through those first couple of months. Like, were you, what, what did you think to yourself at first? I'm going to go after the multimillionaires and billionaires, or did you, did you have a, um, did you have a specific, uh, business goal in mind when you were germinating it? I totally had a split and it proved to be the bane of my existence over the next two years because I knew and still know just deep down in my core that the people that I wanted to work with are young people. I believe that those are the people who need financial advice. They, those are the people who can make small percentage changes and see massive outsized results. Those are the people that will see the highest impact from financial planning. But the only thing that I knew of the industry was one way to charge for the work that I did, which was a percentage fee, where whatever someone invests with you, that you charge them maybe 1% of whatever that lump sum is per year. That's your fee. Well, I immediately hit this problem where I really wanted to work with young people, but may they maybe had $30,000 that I could manage, $40,000. And so financially, it just didn't make sense for me. And it also didn't make financial sense for them because when you're that young, paying a 1% fee can cost you between 17 and 30% of your net worth between now and when you die. And so it was going to be a huge burden on them and it wasn't going to be worth it for me. And so I immediately started looking for young clients. Those are the people that I wanted to work with. And I figured I would figure out the finances later. Explain to me what you mean about that 17 to 30% because that's a pretty staggering number. Are, are you saying that as someone grows from $30,000 to a lot more in the future, and it's always 1%, that kind of like compounding 1% ends up being a, a, a very nice amount of money for the financial planner. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes. And I wish that was only the case. I wish that was the only case because if the financial advisor kept a hundred percent of the money that they took from their clients, at least then someone would be benefiting seriously financially from that change of hands. But there's a whole chunk of that money that doesn't go to the client and doesn't go to the advisor because the whole magic of investing is that it compounds. You don't just make money on what you save. You make money on whatever your investments made the previous year. And so if you make 10% a year, every single year, you're actually making more money because you're making more money or you're making money on a larger pot. That 10% yep. is on a larger sum, right? And the power of compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. But when you get a 1% hit every single year, not only does that 1% go to the advisor, but the next year your returns are not as impactful. And so that exponential curve that everyone shows when they talk about how investments perform over time, that is what gets shortened. That's so what that, slows down. Instead of it's like an uh, kind of a corollary to opportunity cost is what exactly. you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The money would be better left invested than paid to someone else. That being said, I would hope that my financial planner was investing in a similar way to what to what he or she was recommending to me. But I I totally I totally get the point. Um, so I I want to I want to kind of start with where your business is. Maybe you could describe uh, your business today. 
um, who you who you serve specifically, how does somebody pay for your services, what they get, just to kind of like a lay of the land. Then I want to want to work backwards into into what's happened over the last two years, like steps along the way. Absolutely. So as of today, I am a financial planner. So that is different from an investment manager. That is different from a salesperson, and that is in many ways different from a wealth manager. And what I re- what I mean by that is that when someone comes to me, I will spend three or four weeks with them, and I will write a financial plan that they can do themselves. They don't necessarily need me every single year to perpetuate that plan. Some people love to have that oversight. They love to have me manage their money and do their taxes for them. And we include all of that for the people who find it easier, the people who would like to have the experts. But really what we do at its core is we write those financial plans. And the people that we work with are usually between the ages of 24 and 40, give or take. And they are people who have just experienced a large life change. So they might have just received an inheritance. They might suddenly be making far more money than their expenses. They might have just started a family or they are considering starting a family and buying a house, those sorts of things. Things that add to financial complexity very, very simply, very simply, very quickly. And so, and I don't know if you experienced this, but I certainly did. It felt like overnight in my early 20s, my my finances went from being very, very simple to suddenly being kind of overwhelming. Did you have that? Yeah, yeah, for for sure. I mean, within, you know, 36, 48 months, um, marriage, uh, wife went back to school, um, bought a house, had kids, like, yeah, I mean, maybe you're thinking of other complexities. But for me, there was like this window, late 20s to early 30s, where complexity just, just went, went nuts for me. Yeah, it just gets crazy. And it becomes really overwhelming because then not only did you add a financial complexity, you added a life complexity. Now you have to be a father and you have to have a financial plan. And so that usually pulls the cork for someone who's like, all right, I need an expert to tell me exactly what to do so that I can put this on autopilot and focus on the things that fulfill me, like being a parent, like being a homeowner, like traveling. Those are the things and like my job and whatever the career happens to be. Those are the things that they should be focusing on. And so having me in their back pocket to say, okay, if I have a financial question, it's going to be a 30-minute meeting, not a six-hour endeavor. That feels much better to someone who just leveled up that complexity. Yeah. And I remember at at that time, as I was sort of thinking long-term, wondering, would anyone who actually want to talk to me? Because I don't, I don't like have that much money. And so like, and so like, who's, who's going to be one to incentivize to sit down and really, really plan with me. So, um, I didn't get started in that like real financial planning journey with an expert right away. And probably when you would recommend that people do that. Yeah, it gets delayed. And in that delay, you lose out on a lot of opportunities to make really good decisions with your money. The simplest example is that you can only put a certain amount of money in an IRA every year. And so if you don't, you just lose that. And never again in your life can you make that contribution. You can catch up a little bit after you turn 50. But those are the sorts of opportunities that people can miss out on for decades until they finally hit a point where they can sort of commission an advisor that would that needs more money to manage or something of that sort to make it worth their while to take the meeting. So who else is on your team besides you? I mean, at first it was just you and now you have you have a team of folks. Maybe describe the scope of of your business. Absolutely. So our main three points of focus are financial planning, investment management, and taxes. And so myself and my colleague Brian, who is a CPA, we are the people who manage the tax side as well as the investment portfolios and the financial planning. We are what I would call the face of the business. We're the people that you would see in a meeting actually giving you the advice. And then on the backside, we have para planners. We also have people who help us with sales development, as well as at this point, a team of video editors just to help me create content because it definitely got to be a little bit much. And then also on the, the PR side and the publicity side, that's very much where we've focused our time. Because we don't need, 
and this might be a hot take. I don't know how far out of left field I'm going to be coming, but I don't necessarily think that we need a massive team of investment experts and that sort of thing for someone's portfolio. Really, most of the ETFs and other vehicles that people can invest in are already managed by teams and teams of people with multi-decade experience in investment management. And so it's not necessarily my place to be that manager when I can put them into something that will really benefit them and give them access to those experts. I get that. Um, I mean, for me, I get a report every so often that's like a pie chart. And it's like, here, here's how much is invested in this. Here's how much is invested in, in that and kind of like asset classes. And it, it's like a distribution of risk and, you know, risk versus, um, versus a, a reward, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I want to talk about the content marketing engine, your marketing engine, how you're growing your business. You're thinking about growing your business in, in, in a minute, but thinking back over, I guess your business is now almost four years old, three and a half, three, some, something like that. Um, two, two questions, I guess, two part questions. One, do you feel like you were, uh, you had always wanted to be an entrepreneur, like an intentional entrepreneur, or are you an accidental entrepreneur? That, that's one part of it. And then what's one thing like challenge or things that you just did not expect, um, along the way as you've been growing your business, adding to your team, et cetera? I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew that that was my end goal. It was very much at the end of my five or 10 year plan. The original plan was to go and get a job and learn the ropes and study under experts for five to 10 years and then make the leap. So I very much felt like I was accidentally thrust into entrepreneurship, but I knew that it was my end goal and I knew that it was something that I would do at some point. Okay. So the second question was something you didn't expect. So, so it sounds like you always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You had, you had, um, at some point and you had an idea that you wanted to build a business. What, what's a, what's a stumble you had along the way or what's a big surprise you had over the last couple of years that, um, that, uh, that you, you've had to overcome? I think the biggest thing with being an entrepreneur that I just did not understand was the affection for my business. Particularly in the early years, I didn't really care. And I think it was because I had built it out of need and necessity rather than like as something that I really wanted to make my own. And so I was never very attached to it. I wanted it to grow but I didn't really care if it lived or died. I knew that I could go and find something else. I knew that I could go and get a job. I always cared about the clients. They were the ones who really, really mattered. I really didn't care what Hoskin Capital was or what it made me look like. I really cared about was I doing a good job for the people who entrusted me with their life savings. And so it wasn't until maybe six months ago or seven months ago that I really started to understand why people get really wrapped up in their businesses and really fall in love with what they've created and start to call it their child or their baby <laughs> or something of that sort. I only really just started to get that. And I started to get that when I started to see what Hoskin Capital could do for other people as participants in Hoskin Capital rather than clients. When I started building a team, when I started bringing people on and allowing them to participate in Hoskin Capital, that's when I realized that it was truly something emergent because they were like, yeah, I want to quit my nine to five. I want to get out of the corporate life. I have this entrepreneurial spirit, but I would love to work for you. And I would love to be a part of Hoskin Capital because I find that within this business. And I think that was when I started to get attached. So I don't know if that's a stumbling block, but it will very quickly become a stumbling block. Because I know that that affection will cloud the decisions that I make about my business. And I think that for so long, I was able to very, very objectively make arm's length decisions about Hoskin Capital. And now I very well might be making them out of affection or a feeling of protectiveness. And that's something I will need to avoid. That's something I will have to work on. I think that's a really uh, amazing and good insight and rings true for uh, many or all of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with. Um, and, uh, and it, it sounds like you're starting to, to feel like, um, 
like it's got it, it's got it's got a good and a bad. I mean, it, it fuels you to obsess and grow your business, but at the same time, you have to make like de- detached decisions about about what's best. And that can be hard when you when when you love something, whether it's you know a, a family member or, or a business. That's a really cool insight. Let's talk about marketing in your growth engine. Uh, you do a lot of content marketing, create a lot of content for yourself. Maybe for the audience, describe the type of content you create, why you do it, and and um, what it's done for you. Yeah, I mean, I think I fall into the edutainment category where I try to create educational content that is as interesting and engaging as possible so that it doesn't feel like I'm teaching a course or I'm holding a lecture or a webinar or something of that sort. I'm just providing information in a very, very digestible way. And I started creating content almost exactly three years ago. It was January 1st of 2021. So we were still deep in COVID. And again, I had nothing to do. And I had none of the normal advisor mechanisms available to me. I couldn't go out and network. I couldn't go have coffee chats with potential clients. I had to find some way. And TikTok was blowing up. So I was like, I'm sure, let's try it. Why not? We'll, we'll make a couple of videos and see how it goes. And I expressly remember setting a goal that by June 1st of 2021, I wanted to have a thousand followers. I would have counted that as a success because I think at the time I had 200 followers on Instagram, nothing on anywhere else. So if I got up to a thousand, that was going to be a win. And by the end of February, I had over 50,000 followers and it was, it was really, really transformational to say the least. And surprising and and the power of TikTok and clearly good content along the way. And when we were doing our 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 pre-tape conversation, um, we discussed that you had actually started a business around this now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I did. So that's the most recent development. That was in August of this past year. And I got together with Nick Meyer, who is the most followed CFP on social media by a mile. And he is just an extremely qualified human being at doing what I do. But we came at it from very different angles. I did it to build an advisory business. He did it simply to be a content creator and to have that income as someone who is, call it a standalone media company. And so we were both CFPs, which immediately brought us together, but we were on a hike in Denver and we were talking and it became very clear that the thing that we were the best in the world at was being CFPs on social media. There were very few things that we could claim that was like, we are the most followed people. Like we are the most followed people in this niche. We should probably do something about this. And so we've started teaching other financial advisors how to leverage short form video to really succeed in their practice and also educate and just get more good financial information out into the world. Okay, I want to ask uh, ask something about that because um, you've started a company that advises other folks in the industry who are your potential competitors, right? Yeah, and and so um, so why so why and how do you wrap your head around that? It's never really been about me because. The reason I started creating content was only really to educate people. I had just learned so much during my CFP studies, during my degree. I suddenly had so much in my head about finance and it was making my life so much easier that I was like, people just have to know about this. If someone decides to become a client of Hoskin Capital, cool. If not, I will educate as many people as I possibly can. And the response that I got from that was second to none. And so when it comes to letting other people do what is, call it my secret sauce or my competitive advantage, is so much more about getting good, high quality financial education out there. And if I can help someone who has been in the industry for decades, who knows more about finance than I do by so much, specifically in very interesting niches, that's just beneficial for every single person on the platform. And I also know that my competitive moat does not come from the fact that I create content. My competitive moat comes from the fact that I work with young people and that I don't need $250,000 in investable assets to be willing to take a call. 
And so I don't know if I will ever teach someone how to connect with and really engage younger generations. They might do that inadvertently with content, but I don't know if I will teach them how I do that from a practice management standpoint. But to get them in front of the people that will really benefit from the information that they have, it is that's the most important thing to me ever, is just that people know that this sort of thing exists. I think that's a good answer. And, and I was also thinking that um, that as much as you would, you would want to scale to infinity, there are, there are a lot of millennials out there. There are a lot of Gen Zs out there. You're not going to be able to take calls from every single one of them. So I, so I like how you're thinking about, about scaling. It's really, it's really cool. In the show notes, we'll put, um, we'll put your handles so people can check you out. Uh, I love your business story. It's been really fun to talk to you about that. I want to shift the last maybe 10 minutes of the conversation to, um, to maybe tips. If someone is think, thinking to themselves, Okay, I might want to actually do some financial planning. I want to switch what I'm doing. I want to I want to start something new. Um my first question is what should a consumer expect from their financial advisor just from the get-go? Like uh like what what should a financial advisor do do for me? A financial advisor should help you earn more money and protect more money not just manage your investments. They should be an advisor to your finances, not just your investments. Because I think that is a very, very easy thing to get stuck into, especially when you look at the more traditional method of wealth management, is that you will pay someone to manage your investments for you. And they will meet with you once a year, maybe twice a year, and they will tell you that the boat is still floating. And maybe you came into the office, so you'll shake hands and leave, or you'll close, the, you'll close the Zoom meeting, and that's about all you got. And so you know that one part of your finances is working, but you have no idea how it's working in connection with the rest of your life. What if you're planning for another kid? Should your investments change? Should the amount that you have in your emergency fund change? Well, what's an emergency fund? My advisor hasn't talked to me about my emergency fund or told me how much I should have in cash ever. Maybe you picked it up from a Reddit thread or from a YouTube video, but that's not very often what advisors will provide. I think that that holistic education, that should be the standard of your financial advisor. They should be your coach and your teacher and then take the things off of your plate that you would rather not manage yourself. I agree with, with you that the coach part is something that can really be missing in a traditional relationship. and I, I think that's great advice. Um, What's uh, thinking back over the last three to six months, what's the number one question clients have asked you? Um, maybe in the category of, uh, of like, should I be in this? Should I not be in this? Hmm. I always get questions about crypto. And I always tell my clients that I will never advise them against going to Vegas. I will never advise them about spending money to go on a trip. And I will never advise them against maybe lending money or donating money to a good cause. What they do with their money at the end of the day is up to them. But all of those things fall in the same basket of that money is not designed to fuel your life. You are not betting the house on the roulette table. You are not donating your entire net worth to charity. And so I think crypto would fall in that same area where can it be involved? Absolutely. It's not something that I think is going to be the end of the world or the beginning of the new era. We just don't know yet. And you have to account for that risk. I think the other thing that I receive questions on constantly is IRAs, individual retirement accounts. I think that it, they are the most available. And so people hear a lot about them, but they don't really know how they work. They don't really know how your traditional IRA interacts with your 401k. Most people don't know that if you make too much money, you can no longer contribute to a Roth IRA. And so I have been doing a lot of teaching and educating around what role does an IRA play in your life? When should you pick it over a 401k and really dig into that minutia? Because anyone can have an IRA. It's just about which one's right for you and how should you actually make that happen. When clients say, say, okay, I hear you on, on crypto. I hear that it goes in this bucket 
of like, I shouldn't be investing with stuff I can't afford to, I can't afford to lose, but I'd love your recommendation on, on kind of like a, a percentage that I can play with, you know, whether it's to go on a vacation or whether it's invest in crypto or whether it's to, you know, bet on the Packers in the Super Bowl, <laughs> whatever it is, right. how do you, and I get that the answer a lot of times is, is it, is it depends, you know, but, um, but how, how do you advise, advise, um, your clients on how to think about something like that? Well, in an attempt to not be an adult diaper brand, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll give a clear answer. Okay. I think that 5% is the outside limit. 5% of whatever you currently have saved across the board. And it has to fall into a priority list. If you feel like, if you have credit card debt, if you have student loans, if you have a car payment that's making you feel squeezed, If you have a change to your house, like if you have a a repair that you need to do that you've been putting off, like a taillight on your car or a window in your house, something of that sort, all of those tiny fractional expenses, those come before. And so if you're sitting in a place where you're like, I don't really have anything hanging over me. I don't have any doctor's appointments I need to pay for. Yeah, you can you can absolutely go bet on the Packers or you can invest that money in crypto. And I think that doing so will do something extremely important for you, which is it will give you skin in the game to incentivize you to learn about something. Because if you are interested in crypto, even in just a passing flitting fancy, if you buy it, you will look at it. You will learn about how it works. You will learn about what drives the value of it. You will understand how does this thing fit into my life? And is this something that might blow up? where it will become more broadly accepted as a payment currency or something of that sort. And that education is invaluable. And so if you lose $1,000, like I did, I lost more than $1,000. But if you do that to give yourself an incentive to really understand something, that's the same as paying a thousand bucks for a course, but the education is probably better and more poignant because it hurt. And on the other side, you made money if you gained. So I think it's a great thing to experiment with as long as it's not with the house. Yeah, I I, I hear you. Probably good a good approach to poker too, which I I like to do from time to time. Which is which is the, the best way to learn in some ways is to get on the table and and lose and adjust from your mistakes yep. and all 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 that stuff. Before we go, Nate, any personal tips or resolutions you have for 2024, whether it's for you, for your own investing, for your clients, for your business? Yeah, I think that. My main New Year's resolution for 2024 is, well, I have, I have a couple. One is I want to be less busy because I think that people correlate busyness with success and productivity, and those are not the same. Busy is white noise. It's vibration. It's stress. And productivity is focused. And success is focused. And so it's possible to not be busy while also being successful and productive. And that is my main one. And then my random one is that I want to become a Midwestern mom because with meal prepping, Mm -hmm. I think casseroles are genius. I love to cook at home and I am an absolute budget freak. And so I love to do anything I can to save money and prep food and do things that keep me from eating out and keep me from making impulsive decisions. And so having a casserole in the freezer having um, a whole, just a whole bunch of food as if I'm feeding a seven kid family or something of that sort. That's my other one just to save me money and really put me in a place to eat well. You may be able to get more uh, TikTok followers on that thread than with your, your traditional one. It could happen. I'll be on the lookout for that. Nate, thanks so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, John. Did you know that more than 20 million professionals and business owners visit business.com and Business News Daily? Why? It's the best place for resources, advice, and information about how to grow your business. And if your goal is to reach our audience, you should become one of our lead partners, sponsor a section of the site, or sponsor even this podcast. Reach us at business.com slash connect. That's business.com slash connect.